see ya. Glad you trek through the snow. Um, you know those stories where your parents, well, actually, my parents didn't tell me these stories. Maybe some of your parents told you, you know, you had to walk barefoot in the snow eight miles uphill to get to school. Both and ways. Yeah, both ways uphill. I don't know how, I never figured out how that worked, but I'm thankful for cars. Glad you got here safely. I know a bunch of our church family are watching online tonight, and that's great. Glad you've tuned in. I know this evening will be an encouragement as we look at God's word and we sing some songs together. We're going to sing about God's holiness as we begin our service. Hymn number 70, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Let's sing together. You may remain seated as we sing. This evening, as we look at 1 Peter, we're going to talk a lot about the holiness of God and our holiness. And uh, I know that's a great theme to study, and uh, it's going to be interesting as we apply it to our life. Turn over with me to hymn number 200, excuse me, 309. Hymn number 309, let's sing together a couple of verses of Beneath the Cross of Jesus.
bow together for a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for uh, this evening, and uh, Lord, you create all types of weather, and you nourish us, you take care of us, you provide exactly what we need, and uh, Lord, you've given us snow tonight, and we're thankful for that. I pray that you would help us as we worship you tonight, that it would be a worship hour that would be pleasing to you. Um, as the songwriter said, Lord, there are two wonders that we have to confess tonight. We have to w wonder at your glorious love, and we have to wonder at our own worthlessness. Um, those two truths go together. And so I pray today as we uh, come before your throne, as we hear your word, that we would wonder, how could you save and love a worthless soul like ours? And yet you did, and help us to be thankful and glory in that truth as well. We'll give you the praise for what you do this hour, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I, I picked up on another part of that song. I really like this. I ask no other sunshine than the sunshine of his face. Who was it that was in his presence for some days, came off glowing off that mountain? Mm -hmm. That was Moses. Yes, we just got done talking about him this morning, and boy, what an experience that must have been. They had to put a veil over his face, uh, being in the presence of the Lord, and just really radiating um, the presence of God in his life really was uh, no doubt a sight to behold, and would to God that uh, we would have that same glow about us as Christians, that others would see the difference in our whole countenance and our whole being on a regular basis. So I appreciate again the songs and looking forward to a good night tonight. We're glad to have you. Welcome. Uh, we know that a good many of you chose to stay home and that might have been a wise move. I don't know. We're always glad to have fellowship in person. Uh, we believe it's going to be snowing, I guess, all night long and then tomorrow. And so we'll see how many inches we end up with here. But, hey, we're glad to be open and looking forward to a good challenge tonight from God's word. And so we appreciate you that braved the weather. Come on out. And uh, we trust it will be a blessing to you that are home as well. I just want to let you know the missions conference this uh, year has been canceled. It's official this week. I uh, spoke with all the missionaries that we had scheduled to come. And as a result of COVID, uh, we're just not going to be able to interact like we typically would like to and all the things that go with it. So missions conference is a no-go for the year 2021. So pray, uh, we'll see, uh, trying to get a couple of those guys lined up for the next year and trust that the Lord will bless. But that's a, a disappointment. But I, I, I want to let you know that because I know some, again, take vacation and do all kinds of things that uh, are special to be here. And so we're grateful for your sacrifice, but uh, reschedule and save that time for another time. That would be good. Here's one meeting that wasn't on the calendar, but it is going to go next Sunday through Wednesday, and that's Revival Meetings with Morris Gleiser. And uh, we're looking forward to that. Trust that you'll uh, be here for that as well. Hopefully we'll have good weather. Uh, Brother Gleiser has been through a lot. He's an experienced uh, saint of the Lord and Certainly his life testifies of the grace of God in his, in his life and ministry. And so we're really looking forward to hearing all the things that God has done and is doing. And certainly the ministry of the word as it goes forth. So I hope that you'll be here for that. And that would be wonderful. I believe that's all the announcements. We are, some of us are going to be up at the Sweetheart Getaway uh, this coming weekend. And that's uh, available last I checked. I don't know. I assume it's still there. I know they have limited capacity because of COVID. But uh, a couple of us are going to be up there. And we're looking forward to that. So bring you back a good report from Tri-State and trust the Lord will uh, encourage them as uh, we go to be encouraged and strengthened in the walk of the Lord as well. All right, I believe that's it. We're going to take our hymn books one more time. We're going to turn to hymn 389, I Am Resolved.
the last verse. I am resolved to enter the kingdom, leaving the paths of sin. Friends may oppose me, foes may beset me, still will I enter in. I will listen to him, peace and so glad and free. I invite you now to take your Bibles and turn to the book of First Peter, the book of First Peter tonight. We we'll continue our study in the book of First Peter. We'll be in chapter number one this evening. Well, I didn't think it would happen, but we finally finished the first twelve verses of First Peter, and we're going to start verse number thirteen tonight. And uh, I'm going to try to do an impossible task, and that is to go through verse number twenty-five. Uh, tonight, First Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 25 uh, this evening. I just want to do a little bit of review before we get into this passage of Scripture. The first 12 verses, I've preached a message in three parts, I want to say, uh, entitled, Remember Your Identity. Remember Your Identity. And I reminded you of three um, identities that we have as believers that Peter reminds believers in the first century of who they are. And uh, maybe I'll just do a pop quiz since there's not many of us, except Miss Charlotte. Miss Charlotte, you can't answer because you answered all of them last week. And uh, Pastor, you can answer maybe one, all right? Um, so what identity do we have? What do we look at verse number one and two? A stranger in the world, right? A stranger in the world. That's our identity. That's who we are. Uh, our citizenship is not in this world. Our citizenship is in heaven, and so in this world we are strangers. What was the second identity that we have as believers? Yes, we're successors to an eternal inheritance. And the reason that we are successors is because we have a relationship with God that's unique. We are his sons and daughters. We're a part of the family of God. And the third identity I'll give it to you tonight is that you're a sufferer who must rejoice, verses 6 through 12. And I gave you a timeless truth for that message, and that timeless truth was this. In a troubling world, you must combat discouragement by remembering your identity. I hope you, as you go through life, as you went through life maybe this past week, you remembered who you were. You're a stranger. You're a successor. And yes, at times we suffer. We go through hard times, difficult days, but in the midst of suffering, we must rejoice because God may be trying our faith. God may be doing something in our life that we have no idea that he's what he's doing, but we realize we have a response that's necessary and that's a response of rejoicing. And so as we approach verses 1 through 12 in 1 Peter, they're really declarations that Peter is giving us. They're statements that are that Peter is giving us. All the verbs in uh, uh, verses 1 through 12 uh, are predominantly indicative in their mood. In other words, an indicative mood. And you guys say, you're probably saying tonight, man, I didn't come to learn English tonight, Pastor Josh. What does indicative mood mean? It simply means that they're just declarations. They're just statements. They're timeless truths. And he's just laying out truth for you. Remembering your identity is a truth that you just have to remember, rest in, be rooted in, and take hold of. But as he gets to verse number 13, you're going to find something interesting that Peter does. Peter is going to switch from the indicative mood in the verbs that he uses, and he's going to give you four imperative verbs in verses 13 through 25. Up to this point, he has not used a single imperative. You know what imperatives are? They're commands. They're demands. So it's just been indicative. It's just been statements so far, but now he's going to transition into commands into declaratives, into uh, rather imperatives. So look at verse number 13 tonight of 1 Peter 13. I, I want to preach, before we look at this text, a message that I've entitled this, represent your identity. Represent your identity. You say, Pastor Josh, that's basically the same title you had for the other three messages. No, it's different. The first title was remember your identity. That's something you do where? In your mind. That's a, an indicative mood. That's something that you do internally, but representing your identity is something you do to the world. Others see this action. And so Peter is building on the declaratives, and he's going to get to the imperatives in verses 13 
through 25. So I want to give you a timeless truth for this message. What's the timeless truth for verses 13 through 25? Here it is. You must represent your identity by responding biblically to a troubled world. You must represent your identity by responding biblically to a troubled world. Notice verse number 13 of this passage. He says, wherefore. Now stop right there. Anytime that you see the word wherefore or therefore in scripture, it's a transitional word. In other words, Peter is saying, based on everything that I've just told you so far, this ought to be your response. So what has he told us so far? He's told us, remember your identity. Remember who you are as the believer in this world. Those are things that you do internally, mentally. And now he's going to say, wherefore, based on remembering your identity, this is how you apply it in the real world. This is what you do as a result of remembering your identity. Look at it. Gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope. That's the first imperative you see in the book of 1 Peter. The main verb of this sentence is not gird up, it's not be sober. The main verb is hope. Hope. Hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Tonight, we're going to look at these four imperatives that Peter gives in verses 13 through 25, and we're going to see how to actively, in this world, living this in this world, represent the identity that we already know who we are. We already know we're strangers in this world. We already know that we're successor to an internal inheritance. We already know that we are sufferers who must rejoice. That's our identity, but how do we represent that in the real world? Peter is going to give us these four imperatives that show us how to represent our identity. We could say it in this way. You're a stranger in the world, but what does that look like practically? You're a sufferer who must rejoice, but how does that look like practically? You're a successor to an inheritance, but how does that look like practically? And we're going to see several, four uh, responses that our identity demands. The first thing I want you to see tonight is that your identity demands a response of hopefulness your identity demands a response of hopefulness lotus verse 13 again wherefore gird up the loins of your mind be sober and hope that's the imperative that's the command that peter is giving to us and by virtue of of scripture god is giving to us hey how do you represent your identity you must hope you must have a response of hopefulness now The way that we use the word hope, that command may not mean much to you because we use the word hope dramatically different than how Scripture uses the word hope. Uh, The idea of hope in Scripture is not like, hey, I I wonder, I I hope that I'm going to get an A on this test, or I hope that the weather clears up, or I hope that we get 10 more inches of snow, all right? It's just a, 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 a wish or a will. The word hope in scripture is not that at all. The idea of hope in the Bible is that it's a confident, guaranteed outcome that we are tethering to, that we're anchoring to. It's an unchangeable reality somewhere in the distance, and the tether by which we're connected to that reality in the future is the tether called hope. We're holding on by hope hope and we go through life and we attach ourselves to something that's unmovable something that is sure and that tether is called hope that's the idea of the word hope in scripture and so as we're going through life where's a there's a command represent your identity by having hope by fixating our eyes on something sure in the future now what is that now there's different things that we can tether our hope into and scripture even talks about in the book of second uh, in the book of titus that we hope for the uh, return of christ and so our hope is tethered to the return of christ but that's not what this passage says what is our hope tethered to look at it carefully wherefore gird up the loins of your mind be sober and hope to the end for the grace grace so what is peter telling believers to do hey as you go through life your hope must be in grace in grace now look at what he says after that grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of jesus christ now this is interesting the idea of grace to be brought is a present tense verb in other words it's not just grace that god gives when he returns in the second coming in other words this grace is being brought to you right now 
It's a continual action right now, and, and you'll realize the full culmination of this grace when, when everything is over, when Christ comes back the second time. That'll be the final culmination. But grace is being offered to you right now. It's given to the believer daily. It's given enough, and it's sufficient for the believer as he goes through life. So what is your confidence in tonight? Well, the imperative here is your identity demands a response of hopefulness, not in the economy, not in an election, not not in government, but in grace, in grace. And the final realization of that grace will be at the second coming of Christ. And I say, how do I obey this command of fixating my hope on grace? Well, Peter's going to give us two participles. Anytime you see a participle in the New Testament, they're always describing the main verb of the sentence. All right, there's two participles in this verse. He says, wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. That's participle number one, and that's describing hope. So you could draw an arrow around gird up and draw to hope. The second participle is be sober. You could circle that participle and draw an arrow to hope. Both of these words Peter is using in a metaphorical way to describe how you are to obey this command of hoping in grace, uh, putting your confidence in grace. So let's talk about it tonight. What does it mean to gird up the loins of your mind? Well, I've given you a simple definition of it. It's going to be on the, on the screens here. In other words, disentangle your mind. How do you have a response of hopefulness? How do you represent your identity, who you are as a believer, by having hope? Well, you have to, first of all, disentangle your mind. The idea of girding up the loins, you know this. And back in Bible days, everybody wore tunics, including the guys, all right? And whether you were going to fight somebody or whether you were going to run, what you would do is you would gird up the loins of that tunic, that, that uh, long robe that you were wearing. In other words, you would take those robes that were around your ankles and you would bring them up and you would cinch them maybe in a belt or you would tie them together. And so that's the idea of girding up the loins of your mind. Now, obviously, Peter is not telling you, wear a tunic and wrap it up when you want to put your hope in grace. All right? That's not what he's saying. He's using it as a metaphor, and he's applying it to the mind. He's saying, hey, listen, when you gird up the tunic, that means you're getting ready. You're, you're, there's a distraction around you. You need to be focused on your task, and so you're girding up those loins. So he's saying this, hey, disentangle your mind from any distractions so you can be focused on the task ahead. If I could give you one word, it's this, distractions. Get rid of the distractions that keep you from obeying this command. That's what Peter is saying. Listen, it can be a job. It can be finances. It can be health problems. It can even be suffering. You know why revival meetings are so important, why we're going to have them? It's because it's a time to restore and refocus our intention on that which matters most. In other words, it's a time to disentangle our minds from the distractions so we can get back to obeying God. You know, we have a vine on the back of our house, and it seems like every time we trim that vine in a matter of weeks or months, you know, eventually those weeds just kind of wrap up around its way around the house, and it just gets back up. It's kind of like us. You know, there's sometimes distractions in our life, and when God convicts our hearts about them, and we kind of cut those vines down, and we say, you know what, I'm not going to focus on this anymore. I know what God wants me to do, but over a course of a period of time, whether it's months or weeks or years, eventually what happens, those distractions begin to creep up just like that vine against that house. And sometimes God has to when God convicts our hearts again, we remember, hey, listen, this distraction is distracting me, and I need to cut that vine down. It can be family issues. It can be conflicts. Listen, it can be recreational. It can be sports, and it can be something sinful. It can be a sin. It can be lust. It can be envy. It can be anger. It can even be a relationship. What do you need to free yourself of, disentangle your mind of, so that you can actively hope? God is demanding it. He's commanding it. It's an imperative. And here's why it's so important. Here's why it's so important. What saddens my heart is when I hear sometimes the most doom and gloom type of people are Christians. That's what saddens me. Paul, the, the idea of, of, of distractions, Paul would say it this way. Don't be distracted with the affairs of this life that you may please him who hath chosen you to be a soldier. Jesus is coming. We have a mission, 
And if you want to represent your identity, that you're a stranger in the world, stop putting your hope in the everyday mundane things of life that distract you. Get your eyes back on the Lord. Get your, back, uh, get your eyes back on the grace that he supplies to make it through this journey of life. Don't be doom and gloom. Have hope. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on the grace that he gives you. Gird up the loins of your mind. Put aside the distractions. Disentangle yourself from the weeds of this world and get your eyes on Christ. Get your eyes on his grace. That's the idea. The second part it simply gives is be sober. Now, clearly, the word means is relating to someone that's drunk. Have you ever met someone that is, or have talked to someone that's drunk? They usually don't think very clearly. Uh, they don't often accentuate their IQ or heighten their IQ because of being under the influence. In fact, when you're under the influence, you really can't control much because you're under the influence. And so Peter's using this word as a metaphor again. You can't really gird up the loins of your mind physically. That's a mental, that's a, a metaphor. He's saying be sober, but he's not really talking about alcohol, although that's the illustration he's giving. We could say it this way, not only disentangle your mind, but discipline your mind. When you're under the influence of alcohol, you are not disciplined. You are not disciplined. Have you ever heard the phrase, you know, drunk on emotions? You know, your emotions can get the best of you sometimes, can't they? Uh, these whimsical ideas that are disjointed from reality, and those control people. You know, I've met believers, they are controlled by their emotions. They don't have a disciplined mind to separate truth and reality from that which is fiction and emotion. And what Peter is instructing believers to do is, hey, listen, tether your anchor to the realities of God's word and truth, and don't just go every which way that your emotions dictate. Hey, just because you read an article on Fox News doesn't mean that it's true. And on this side, just because you read an article on CNN doesn't mean that it's true. Hey, just because you saw it on Twitter doesn't mean it's true. But just because you saw it on Parler doesn't mean it's true either. Hey, this is what God is in, it, instructing us to do. Discipline your mind. Don't be up and down. Don't be drawn with your emotions. Don't be drunk on the emotions. Discipline your mind to reason, to think through rationally, and filter everything through the word of God. And if you do that, that will enable you to fixate on something that is certain, the hope of God's grace, which will be realized at his second coming. Discipline your mind to be rooted in the realities of God's word and not the sways of our culture, politics, and society. And so here's the application. We're making it really practical tonight because we talked about remembering your identity, but this is how you represented your identity. I'm a stranger in the world. All right, Josh, how does that look like in the real life? You're at work, and the boss knows you're a Christian, but your boss and you have some very similar political views. And he begins talking about some things that you believe with, but he comes at it from an angle as an unbeliever as a very doom and gloom kind of way. You know what I'm talking about? You're a believer. You might agree with his political views. You might agree with the angle that he's coming at, but you have a responsibility that's different than his responsibility or his inclinations. And that's that you have a hope that is far more sure than the anxiety and fear that he experiences, though you may have the same point of view politically or socially. So what is it that you must do? You must not just go along with his emotion of doom and gloom. You must interject into that conversation hope. This is how you represent your identity. If you really are a stranger in the world, stop acting like you're a citizen of the world. How unbelievers are acting. Interject hope. Interject hope. It's a command. It's a command. Our hope is not in government. Like I said, it's not in people. It's not in a hashtag. Our hope is not in our emotions. Our hope is in him and the grace that he provides. I want you to see, secondly, our identity demands a response of holiness. Our identity demands a response of holiness in verses 14 through 16. The second imperative that Peter gives is all the way in verse number 16. He says, because it is written, be ye holy. That's the imperative. But really, this conversation starts all the way back at verse number 14. Look at it. He says, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. What is he saying? He's saying, listen, you're saved. As a result of being saved, you're children of God, and you ought to be obedient children. And if you're obedient children, 
the response of that is you shouldn't fashion yourselves according to your former lust. How you lived formerly before you got saved. The word lust is the idea of passions, appetites, cravings, and he says, in your ignorance. Hey, you went after whatever the world goes after. Hey, whether it's lust, whether it's envy, whether it's things that the world says is important, money, finances, pleasure, riches. Hey, that's what you were craving. That was your appetite. And you did it out of ignorance until God saved your soul. But now as obedient children, as saved, as born again believers, you have a different appetite. You have a different hungering. You have a different craving. And that's for the things of the Lord. So don't fashion yourselves according to those former lusts. What does the word fashion mean? It's the same word translated as the word conformed in Romans 12, verse number two, when he says, be not conformed to this world. It has the idea of putting into a mold. When I was in, uh, in middle school, we used to take a yearly field trip to a zoo called the Brookfield Zoo. Has any, any of you heard of the Brookfield Zoo? It's there in Chicago, maybe. All right. I got a baby over here. It's a, it's a really great zoo. There's two zoos in Chicago that I know of, at least big ones. The Lincoln Park Zoo, which is a little more famous, is downtown Chicago. And Brookfield Zoo, which was not as famous, but it was a way better zoo, way more attractions. They had an awesome dolphin show. But remember, when I went to the zoo, my mom would give me some money to spend at the zoo. You remember those days in field trips when the, the parents would give you money? It was never enough. You could never get everything that you wanted. But you had maybe 5 or $10, I don't remember what it was, to buy what you wanted that day at the zoo. And now looking back, I spent my money very poorly whenever I went on field trips. Usually it was buying stuff that I could eat and be gone in, in a few moments. But it was something that I always bought when I went to the Brookfield Zoo. In every one of their like, main uh, attractions, whether it was like the pachyderms, you know, the elephants and the anteaters and all that stuff, at the end of an, ex uh, an exhibit, is that what they call an exhibit of, you know, where you see the animals? Anyway, they would have a machine... And it was a wax machine. I don't know what those machines are called, but there was a mold, like a metal mold. And what happened, you'd put your quarters in there, or you'd put your money in there, and this max would, uh, wax would come into this mold, and this metal mold would come around the wax, and whatever it was for every exhibit, if it was an elephant exhibit, it would be an elephant. It would pour this wax in there, and there would be an elephant mold, and it would press it, and it would dry, and it would pop out a little wax elephant, and you could take it home. And I remember buying, like, three or four of those. I, I don't even know why a kid would want one of those because you can't really do anything with them. They can break and anything. But that's the idea of fashion, right? It's a mold. And he's saying, hey, the world has a particular mold. And when you step into that lifestyle and you do everything that the world does, guess what? Everybody looks the same. They go for sin. Uh, they live a certain way. They have a certain craving. And you can be pressed into the mold of the world. And he's saying, listen, don't press yourself. Don't be conformed to the mold of the world because you're different. Hey, there's a different mold that you fit in. When you're born again as a child of God, there's a different type of mold that God wants you to be uh, formed into. And that form is not lust of ignorance. It's something called holiness. Holiness. I want you to look at the next verse. All right. He says, but as he which hath called you holy... So be holy in all manner of conversation. The word conversation means lifestyle. Everything that the world does, they want you to fit that mold. But as a believer, your mold is holiness in all manner of conversation. Hey, there's a certain mold of how the world wants you to live and think and act. But remember your identity. Who are you? You're a stranger in the world. You're a son of God, and you're a sufferer who must rejoice. And the mold of that identity is a mold called holiness. Holiness. Holy. We have this idea of holy being like a monk somewhere or maybe a halo over an angel. That's not what the idea of holiness is at all in the Bible. There's a couple of different, different definitions of it, but the very simplest one is separated. Separated from the world and separated to God. I'll give you an illustration of this. When you marry somebody, it's called holy matrimony, isn't it? Why is it called holy matrimony? You're saying, listen, there's a lot of women in this world, but this one is the one I'm separating to. I'm separating from all the other ones, and I'm separating to this one. You know, if I were to date other women after being married to Megan... Uh, there'd be a lot of ladies in here who'd come down and slap me on the backside of my head. I don't think that's a wise thing to do. That's probably the least of the things that you would do. 
In the same way, I don't think it would be very appropriate if my wife who's married to me is dating other men. You would say, you know, that's not right. You know why? Because the covenant that we made is a covenant of holy matrimony. We made a covenant to separate from all others and separate to each other. And that's the covenant that God wants you to make. Hey, you're separated from the world and you're separated to him. That means the way the world thinks and acts and does things, you don't do it like they do anymore. As a believer, you do things as God wants you to do them. And so tonight, how can I have a fixed hope on his grace? You've got to get your mind in the harness. You've got to sober up and stay mentally and spiritually alert. How can you be holy? Stop doing that which you used to do and start doing what God does. Stop being like you were when you were unredeemed in ignorance and start being like the one who redeemed you and bought you and purchased you. God didn't just set the standard, by the way. God is the standard. He says he is holy and be holy as I am holy. God's not just giving you a metric to measure up to. God's saying I am the metric. I am the rule. I am the standard. We could preach an entire message on these verses. These are quotations from Leviticus. We won't have time to go to it, but I just want you to get this from this point. You want to represent your identity. You want to, you remember your identity. You're a stranger in the world. You're, you're a son of God. You want to represent that? You have to live a holy life. That's the practical implication. It's a command. It's an imperative, Peter says. Be holy. Your identity demands a response of holiness. Thirdly tonight, your identity demands a response of honorableness. Your identity demands a response of honorableness. Notice the next verse, verse 17. And if ye call on the Father. Now pause right there. The word if has different meanings. I could say if you were to die tonight. Now the chances of that are, you know, slim compared to the statistic. Now is there a chance that you could die tonight? Surely you could. But the chances of that are low if I were to say that. But if I were to tell my wife, hey, if you're going to close up that piano, put the cover on. That's more the idea of, hey, since you're already doing that, listen, if you're going to go out the door, turn off the lights. You know, it's, it's, it's more of an idea of, since you're going out the door, go ahead and turn off the lights for me. That's the idea of this word, since. He's talking to believers. And so, since you call on the Father, since you already address God as Father, since you're born again, right? That's the idea here. It's not open-ended, but it's, 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 he's saying since. He called the Father, who without respect of persons, judgeth according to every man's work. What is God, what is Peter saying? He's saying this, listen, you call God your Father, right? That's what you do. You have a relationship with him. You're a believer. And remember who God is. Remember the context of what First Peter is written to, all right? Or, or to whom First Peter is written to. It's written to suffering individuals, people that are going through persecution, people that may be ans- asking the question, God, why am I being hurt? Why am I being persecuted? Why am I being pressed down by this world? And Peter's reminding them, remember, hey, listen, I will be the judge. Hey, I'll take care of it. You do what you're supposed to do. I will judge these people according to what they're doing to you. That's what Peter's reminding them of, all right? God will take care of it. Hey, God's your father. God's the dad. Have you ever, you know, sometimes moms, uh, you know, often will say, I'll let dad take care of that when he gets home. You know, talking about discipline, right? That's the idea here. Listen, hey, dad will take care of it. Hey, you might be hurting. You might be suffering. You might be in a troubled world, but dad will take care of it, all right? The father will take care of it. But what are you supposed to do in the meantime? Look at it. He says, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. This is the third imperative in this chapter. Pass the time of your sojourning. That word, sojourning, comes from the idea of being an exile, of being a stranger, of being a foreigner. Same word that's used earlier in the chapter. So what is Peter saying? Listen, your identity, you're an exile. That's your identity. How do you represent that identity? Pass the time of your exile here on this earth in fear. Fear of the people that are persecuting you? No. Fear of who? In fear of God. In fear of God. That's who he's talking about. Hey, listen, your father, you call him father. God will take care of those people. But as you're traveling as an exile, remember your identity. How you represent that identity? Fear God. The word fear has the idea of reverence, honor, and respect. Honor. The idea of honor. Why should you honor God as, a, as representing your identity. I'll give you two reasons tonight. First of all, because of your relationship. 
because of your relationship. What do you call your God? Father. Now, I don't know everybody's relationship with their fathers tonight, but I know the relationship that I had with my dad. I dare never dishonor my dad. There's a relationship there where he is my dad, and he would say this, I brought you into this world, and I can take you out of this world. And even that phrase instilled a heart for me to honor him, because I knew what would happen if I dishonored my dad. You know what's interesting about the word honor in uh, the Greek language? It's the word teme. I only tell you that not to say to you I could speak a Greek word, right? Anybody can do that. The idea of teme, if you transliterate that word, it's four letters. You can sound it. Anybody can do this. Teme. T-I-M-E. That's how you spell it. What does that spell? Time. You know the best way you honor somebody? Giving them time. That's what the word actually is transliterated as. So let me ask you, how much time have you spent with God? If you're going to represent your identity to the world, that means you have to honor God, and that means you have to spend time with God. How much time did you spend with God this week? How much time with God have you spent in the last month, in the last year? You know, when I want to honor my dad, what do I do? I I spend time with him. I I ask him questions. I, I, you know, I I want to call him on the phone if I really want to honor my dad. I like when full-grown sons go home to mom and dad and say, mom and dad, what can I help you around the house? How can I be an assistance to you for how all those years that you poured into my life? How can I help you now? That's honor. And your identity as a son of God, that's the relationship, demands a response of honor to him. But not just with your time, but also with your conduct. There's some things that if I did right now here, all the way in New Jersey, and that word got back to my dad, you know what that would do? It would bring great dishonor to him because that's not how he raised me. That's not what he expects of me. And just that same way, there are some things that God expects from you because of your relationship with him. He is your father, and you are his son or daughter, and the way that you honor him is not just with your time, but with your conduct. How are you doing with that tonight? How are you doing with that in this past week? So the first reason why we must have a response of honor is because of our relationship. But secondly tonight, because of your redemption. Because of your redemption. Look at verse number 18. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed, the idea of the word redeem is bought back, purchased with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. The Puritan writer Thomas Watson said this, Great was the work of creation when he made you but greater the work of redemption when he bought you. Hey, listen, it's one thing that you have a relationship with God and that he is your father, but never forget how that relationship came into being. It's not just because you were born that you're a son of God. It's because you were redeemed that you're a son of God. God paid the ultimate price so that you could be a son or daughter. He did not buy you back with the things of this world, things that don't amount to much, things that are futile or things that are vain, the idea of corruptible in this passage. God bought you and purchased you with what? With the precious blood of his son. Never forget the cost of redemption. And when a believer truly comprehends how much God gave so that he could have eternal life in heaven and salvation, the glories of it, the natural response for a believer is this, how can I honor God? You honor God because of your relationship, and that relationship is made possible because of redemption. And that's what verses 18 through 21 are all about. A price was paid for your soul. And so your identity, our relationship with God as redeemed sons demands, it's an imperative, honoring him above all else. Hey, when the world is pressing down on you, when troubled times come, when the world is squeezing you to recant your convictions, remember the price. Hey, remember the purchase. Remember your identity and then respond, not with hate for the world, but honor towards God. Not with a dejected heart or dragging your feet. No, honor God. 
And this honoring of God means that you may offend some people. Hey, standing for the Lord and respecting him and his word above all else, standing on the principles of God's word, make, make you an enemy of the world, in the eyes of the world. But let it be so. Why? Because that's who I am. That's my identity. I'm purchased. I'm redeemed. I'm a stranger of the world, and I'm a son of God. And I must represent that identity by honoring him above all else. So are you representing your identity, Christian? What are we redeemed for? That we might enter into a vital living relationship with the true God. And this is really explored in verse number 21. That we might live in faith and hope. But we just don't have time to look at all those verses here tonight. Go back to the cross and you'll remember why you must respond in honor toward God. So tonight... Your identity demands a response of hopefulness. These are imperatives in the text. Your identity demands a response of holiness, verses 14 through 16. Your identity demands a response of honorableness to God because of your relationship, because of your redemption. And the final thing tonight, final response, your identity demands a response of love. Now, you don't know how much it irked me that I could not come up with another H. (laughs) Sometimes alliteration gets the best of preachers. But I never want to let my alliteration get in the way of what the text is saying, all right? So it's just love, all right? That's what the word says. We're just going to use that word. Verses 22 to 25. Would you look at it? Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. This is not something that you are doing. It's something the Spirit is doing. That's what the text says. Unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye, here's the imperative, the fourth imperative in this passage of scripture, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as a flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Your identity demands a response of love. Verse number 22 tells us that, first of all, it's a work of the Spirit of God. A work of the Spirit of God. What you see in the text is that love for one another is a fruit of salvation. It's a fruit of salvation. One of the products of being purified, the idea of the word purified, really has has the idea of sanctification. Hey, when you get saved, God puts you on a journey to become more like Jesus Christ. And in that journey, God is doing what in you? He's purifying you. He's taking out the impurities, and he's making you more like Christ. And that's a process. And as you're working in that process, as you're going through that process, rather, as you obey God's word, the Holy Spirit begins to produce fruit in your life. A life that is, uh, that is absent of the fruit of the Holy Spirit is a life that either, first of all, is not saved, he's not born again, or secondly, has stymied or quenched the work of the Spirit of God and is not being sanctified. But if a, a believer submits to the will of the Holy Spirit and is going through life saying, Lord, I know that I haven't made it, would you show me areas in my life that I've fallen short, I'm willing to confess my sins, get on the right path, I might mess up here and there, but I'm going to get on the right path and I'm going to be sanctified through your power, through your grace. A believer that is doing that, actively doing that, will see fruit come in his life that the Spirit of God produces. And if you were to go to Galatians, you'd find the very first fruit of the Spirit is love. And he says the Spirit produces love. It's in the passive voice. In other words, it's not something that you do of yourself. You can't just think really hard and muster some more love in this passage. It's something the Holy Spirit, it's a work that the Holy Spirit does through you but you say pastor josh but i thought you said it was a command to love well it is look at verse number 22 seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth of the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren that's what the holy spirit produces and now he says what in the next part of that verse see that you love one another so that kind of seems like a contradiction doesn't it if the holy spirit produces love why am i commanded to love and here is how i reason or rationalize this The Holy Spirit gives you the capacity to love and produces that love, but he doesn't take away your agency to demonstrate that love or show that love. It's cooperation. In other words, apart from the Holy Spirit, there's no way you could love. Working with the Holy Spirit, you can actively demonstrate his love to others. 
is what Peter is saying. It's a command. He says, see that you love one another. Who's he talking to? Believers loving other believers. Listen, here it is. If you're a stranger in the world and you're a sufferer who must rejoice and you're a son of God, that's what I remember as my identity. How do I represent that identity? I must love one another another how is the world going to see that you have reckoned yourself as a stranger in the world by the love that you have for one another that means when you harbor bitterness and you're angry and you're resentful and you say i can't believe what she did or he did i can't love that person because of who they are or their character or their personality you are not representing your identity as a believer You are called to love one another. Love one another with a pure heart, fervently. The word fervently means to stretch to the limit. It was actually used of horses that would run so hard that they would actually die at the end of their task. Um, I don't want to give you a gruesome illustration, so if you can't take a little gruesome illustration, just close your ears. I remember when I was playing basketball and I tore my ACL, I remember, I won't gonna go get into the details of it, but that action, I remember that I had stretched that ligament to its point where there was nothing that it could do but pop or snap. And I know that's a gruesome illustration, but this word fervently is really an actually a really graphic term in the original language. It's the idea of stretching to the point where it cannot stretch just another centimeter more. So love each other fervently to the maximum point. And so love with the right motive, he says, with a pure heart. Love to the farthest degree fervently. And don't just love externally, he says, love from the heart. Let it be real love. What an amazing picture of what the Spirit of God can enable us to do as we're being purified, as we're being sanctified. And what an amazing command that we must carry out. It's a response. It's a representation of our identity when we love one another. And finally, it's a work, not only the Spirit of God, but it's a work of the Word of God. And that's what verses 23 through 25 is all about, being born again, he says, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Peter closes this conversation out, and he segues into another one as we approach chapter number two next week, talking about the, the, the primacy of the Word of God. And we're going to use maybe some of these verses to segue into that, but he's going to talk about the Word of God. He makes it very clear that apart from the Word of God, everything that we've just talked about is impossible. It's impossible. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Hey, someone along the way planted a seed called the word of God. He says it's not a corruptible seed. It's an incorruptible seed that's produced fruit in your life. Listen, if you don't have a relationship with the book, you will never represent your identity. Why should you love the way that Peter commands you to love? Well, the reason here he's giving is for you've been born again, verse number 23. You've been born again. Yeah, agent by which you were born again is not something futile or vain. It was the power of the word of God. So I want to ask you tonight, do you remember your identity? You say, Pastor Josh, I remember those messages. You preached three messages on them. Of course I remember my identity. I've heard it over and over and over again. Good. You probably hear it a couple more times in the coming weeks. I want to get it in your head. Hey, you're a stranger. You're a successor. You're a son, which that means, and you're a sufferer who must rejoice. But the question tonight is, are you representing that identity? one thing to know it up here but it's another thing to live it out in the real world does the world know your identity do people know that you're a believer do people know you're a stranger do people know that you're a success do people know that you're a sufferer who's still rejoicing if you're going to represent your identity it demands some responses your identity demands a response of hopefulness holiness honorableness and love there was a reception honoring a musician called, uh, named Sir Robert Mayer on his 100th birthday. And there was an elderly British socialite who was invited. Her name was Lady Diana Cooper. Lady Diana fell in a conversation with a very friendly woman, woman who seemed to know her well, even though she had not uh, realized that she had met this woman before. Lady Diana had some failing eyesight. She couldn't really make out who this woman, is, woman was, but she talked to her as she was talking to her best friend. 
she spoke to this lady, and she spoke uh, to this lady as any friend. And Lady Diana's intrigue grew more to whom uh, intrigue grew and curiosity grew to find out who this lady, this friendly lady, was. She began to squint her eyes and to look closer to make out the silhouette of the person that she was seeing, but she could not see her face. But this is what she could see. She saw magnificent diamonds. She saw costly and royal gems, and she saw costly linens. And these linens, gems, and diamonds were only representative of the queen herself. What Lady Diana realized was that she was talking to Queen Elizabeth. And then this is what I want to ask you. Christian, is your apparel that of a royal son of God? Though people might not even know that much about you, can they see your identity by the apparel that you wear? You say, by the clothes that I wear? No, that's not what I'm talking about. Not wearing costly gems or fine linen. No, we may be poor pauper strangers, exiles in this world all the days of our life, but are you representing your identity through the apparel of the hope in God? The gems of holiness, the crown of honor that you're giving to God, the linens of love for the brethren. Because if you're not wearing that apparel, how is the world to recognize who you are and what your identity is? How are they going to recognize you as the son of God? You see, you have to not just remember your identity. Peter's telling these believers, you're suffering. But in this troubled world, you have to respond biblically and represent your identity. May God help this church and our believers here in this congregation not just remember identity, but live it out and represent it. Let's bow together for a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that we were able to cover this passage of Scripture and look at how Peter segues from the ethereal, the mental concepts, to the practical applications of God's word. Not just remembering who we are, but fleshing it out by having our hope fixated on the grace of God, living a holy life, having a love for the brethren that's real, that's genuine, that's fervent, having honor towards you because of our relationship and because of our redemption. May you help us through your spirit to live these truths out even this week. And we'll give you the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 493. Since the Savior found me, pardon all my sin. Let's stand together and we'll sing one or two verses of Since the Savior Found Me. Since the Savior found me, pardon all my sin. I have had the joy and living hope within. Gone is all the shame and sorrow. Save, 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 I know he's mighty child. 
was good. That was rich. Praise God for his word and for servants that deliver the goods. I uh, appreciate that, brother. That was a blessing. I'm thankful for our study in 1 Peter. Uh, I'm happy that you were able to come out and enjoy this with us. And for you that stayed home, I trust that you were just as blessed as we were to be here tonight. So God is good. Grateful again for some good preaching and teaching here tonight. Thanks for being with us. Lord bless you. Lord willing, we'll see you on Wednesday. Thank you.